using identification and also by uh, having waivers. Let's talk about the first one before I reveal the slide. What do you think that one means? Uh, how how come by leasing a facility, a corporation or organization is limiting their liability? You ask for organization and you don't buy, instead you instead you lease, and that in itself is limiting your liability versus if you would have bought. Yes. Because they don't Somebody else, the, the, the tenant, the landlord, is responsible for anything that might happen that is reliable uh, to the premises, that, that is related to the premises, right? The facility owner will generally remain liable for injuries that are premises uh, related. And again, there's injuries that result from uh, unsafe premises, like you were pointing out if uh, they're still responsible for making sure that, let's say, the electrical wires are not you know, hanging all over the plate, or that the hole in the wall is repaired, or the hole in the floor, that type of thing, right? Uh, they're still re responsible for the infrastructure, for the building. So if the building is falling apart in some places, and then somebody gets injured, uh, again, the owner of the facility still retains that liability for the building. Uh, so the corporation would only be liable for activity-related uh, injuries, right? So, um, so if you are kind of a, a leasing that building, that facility, to conduct your uh, hockey, hockey uh, summer camp, where it can be winter camp, <laughs> anyway, if you are leasing that place to to run a, a hockey. Um, and then people get, you know, injured because, you know, flying pods or sticks or whatever it is, uh, then that's more on you, on the organization, right? So activity related, that would be yours. Facility related, that would be the owner of the facility. And that's how you as an organization can kind of uh, limit your liability, you see? You're just kind of, uh, out of two, you are just being liable for one. Limit your liability, right? uh, independent contractors. Um, uh, when a corporation actually uh, hires an independent contractor to uh, work on a project, they are shifting everything that has to do with that project, all the liability is being shifted to the independent contractor, right? Uh, certain elements have to be present for us to identify that the person is indeed an independent contractor and not an employee, a paid employee, right? So one of those characteristics is that the independent contractor uh, is engaged for a specific uh, project. So again, you just need like a new wall built within the, within the facility, or that rail, or whatever it is. You know, so they're just going to be working on a specific project for a certain period of time, right? Uh, I would imagine uh, that some of the people working uh, on on this thing, project down there that we can hear, they're probably independent contractors, right? Um, they usually, the, the, the job is usually uh, done for a set amount of money, for a set sum, so it's just like one payment of whatever they tell you the job is gonna cost. Um, they may do their job, the job in their own way, so you are pretty much hired they kind of uh, are the people that always do that type of job, and they know how to do it, and they have a, their own system and processes to do it, right? So if all you, all the input that you do, that you give, is here's what I need built, or here's what I need done, right? Uh, and then they do it their own way. And, and you just kind of, uh, at the end, you get what you want, pretty much. Right? You don't really put input into, well, you start over here, and then you kind of uh, use this this level, or this stair, or this ladder, or no. They do it their own way, right? Um, they uh, often furnish their own equipment. So they're not using like your organization's uh, nothing, right? Your hammers or nails, or anything like that. They come, they bring their own equipment, right? Um, uh, and then they're subject to minimal restriction on how, you know, how they operate, how they do their thing, right? Uh, an employee is hired by the, an employee is hired by the organization 
uh, they are paid a said uh, wage or salary, and they must perform the work as directed by the employer, by the employer, right? So you see those differences between the two lines. So let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So if somebody was to go out there and mess around where they're doing construction in the gym, and they were to fall, it's the uh, the con independent contractor's fault. Yeah, if it was, if it was a, you know, let's say that, um, yeah, pretty much, okay. like, because, you know, their tools, their equipment is around there, uh -huh. and all of that, yeah, they will be, they will be liable. Oh. They will be liable. And so, and so, they, their, their university probably will kind of, uh, you know, say, hey, it was their workspace, they were responsible for it, they are the ones who, you know, have control over it, you know, what the project is ongoing. Oh, okay. That's not to say that uh, the university wouldn't be named, but you know, they obviously uh, experienced lawyers and whatnot will be able to kind of uh, utilize this side of the law to say, wait a minute, the institution has nothing to do here. Right? These are independent contractors, and here's what they will say about it. And, you know, so probably uh, the case for the university will be really strong, right? That they are not liable for it, right? So again, it's not always it means that people are not going to name you in the law, so it's just that probably your defense is, is easier, if you will, you know, if some of these things are present. Does that make any sense? All right. Question, other questions about that one? Independent contractors is another way that corporations can be liability by shifting that road responsibilities to the independent contractor. Uh, indemnification is another way of uh, Limiting liability, and this is pretty much an agreement by which one party agrees to identify, reimburse, or restore the loss of another upon occurrence of an anticipated uh, loss. And um, this is also called, you know, name, or you can actually think of it as a settlement. You know, you really want to go through the process of the trial. Um, in the grand scheme of things, you might think uh, it's better to in identify this person, kind of a settle with them instead of going through the trial, they potentially uh, lose a lot more money, right? Um, when you're a big corporation, sometimes just because of the sake that you are a big corporation, uh, juries are gonna sympathize with, you know, the one person um, that is living uh, paycheck to paycheck, and so, you know, they are going to side with it. So you kind of, if you see uh, that, that uh, if you go to trial, you might be on the, on the short end of the stick, you probably want to you know, settle, identify the person, and kind of get it over with, right? Just like you're to pay him whatever sum of money, and then the issue is, is resolved, right? Uh, the one, the, the next one that we, wait, do we do waiver? <coughs> uh, waivers, we're gonna talk more in depth uh, in the next chapter, which is about defensive against liability. And again, uh, a waiver is when a person signs uh, an agreement uh, saying that they kind of uh, understand, you know, they assume the risk, they kind of uh, understand the risk that are inherent to that activity, and pretty much they're waiving the right to sue uh, for simple negligence. But we'll kind of uh, talk, we'll talk about it in more detail when we get to that. Can I use that first slide again? participant, instructor, or, or, and officials. So, you know, we talk a lot, a lot about uh, battery and assault in this uh, tort law, but, you know, we do have sports that are contact sports where, you know, that line can get a little bit blurry if you will. So, participants and co-participants, uh, the reckless standard says that a participant is not liable to a co-participant unless she or he was reckless or intended to cause injury. So again, um, a lot of sports, you know, rugby, football, etc. they are inherently uh, contact sports and people are gonna get tackled and whatnot. Uh, so people are usually not really responsible or found liable uh, for doing that to another participant. 
So in other words, the action has to be really uh, reckless, right? Like uh, really kicking somebody on the knees or you know doing something beyond what's allowed within that sport. Does that make any sense? Uh, so just kind of being a little bit broad within the uh, within what is permitted and allowed and in that sport, it's not really gonna make you liable for that or for right? If they, they get hurt, but you're still right within the what is permitted. Um, it's only when you are intentionally being, you know, uh, beyond what is allowed and that other person gets hurt. Uh, so it, we had the contact score exception. Participants in contact scores are not liable for acts of ordinary negligence against all participants. So, you know, like if I play tennis and then, you know, one of the other guy comes to the net, I hit a probably really hard towards, towards, you know, that direction and he hits it right on the eye, I wouldn't become a liable, you know, it's unfortunate if I still an accident, right? That's kind of what the first one is saying, you know. Unless uh, the point is over, right, and I bounce twice on my side, the point is over, the guy was, you know, not thinking that the ball was going to come back and then I hit it back to him and then hit it on the eye. That would be different. Right? I was reckless, right? But as long as we're still playing the point, the guys get hit in the eye, uh, you know, I wouldn't be fine at all. It's part of the game. Um, but if the bounce bounce, the ball bounce is twice, point was over, I still hit it, hit it on the eye, different story. And then same thing with the contact sport, you know. By the nature, uh, you're not going to be fine at all for acts of ordinary things. So, so, like, big thing would be, like, fighting in hockey, right? Like, still considered. Exception, it, 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 it's considered part of the game, is that what you're saying? Yeah, right. Like, so it would be the exception. You know? It would be an exception, yes. I mean, uh, because it's, it's one of those, and it's one of those yeah. weird exceptions in which uh, it seems to be kind of like inherent to that sport, right? Um, now, if you get, if you cross a line and you actually kind of a break the other guy's something or, you know, right. uh, beyond just your little scaffold that you usually see, you know, um, then you will be liable, right? That will be kind of a crossing that reckless line. And, you know, if you actually take his helmet off and then start, you know, hitting it with the stick or whatever, that will be just pretty much a soul. And yeah, you will be liable. So there's also even there, there's limits, right, of, of, of what's allowed. Uh, and then, uh, liability when it comes to instructors or officials, uh, they can uh, be legally liable if they breach a duty and that breach results in an injury. So we already kind of have talked about the instructors or the coaches, you know, they have that uh, obligation or duty to, uh, you know, know over the athletes, make sure that the equipment is being worn, that is functioning properly, that does like that. And same thing with the officials, right? I mean, there are certain sports that probably require uh, the officials to um, make a walk, uh, uh, make sure that the fields are okay, you know, uh, that type of thing. And if they don't do that, if one of the athletes get injured, uh, they can be liable for not doing their job pretty much, omitting, right, omission. Questions or comments about negligence? You look like you have a question or a comment. Um, so this happened back in Australia, but it was so our rugby, so like our football. Um, this guy got lifted in a tackle and he got dumped on his head and then he was paralyzed. Right. But then he filed a like complaint against like. The National Football League kind of thing. Uh -huh. So like, maybe it's the differences in war, but like, it's all part of the game. So like, after that, then they like changed the ruling, like you can't lift above like shoulder. Uh -huh. But before that, there was no rule. There was so no like, rule. Yeah. that's like confusing. Yeah, I mean, if there was no rule before that, and it was considered part of the sport, um, you know, uh, probably, most likely wouldn't have been a negligent or anything like that act until somebody break their neck, right? Yeah. Then... But he won, like, that's the thing. Yeah, that's exactly, it. that's what I mean. Like, uh, he probably won because it was so severe, right? It was so damaged that he probably said, hey, um, 
and as and I'm pretty sure that as a member of the juror, jury, rather, uh, we would also want to compensate somebody like that, right? That, you know, um, so there are certain exceptions, and again, you know, uh, it's always up to for interpretation in case by case, right? Um, and again, if you have it in Australia, they also probably have different set of uh, rules that they go under. Um, they probably don't use the same legal system that we do here, but, but still, even if it would happen here, I think that we would still see that as, um, we would find a way to keep the other person accountable, or hold the other person accountable, and make sure that this person gets some sort of conversation somehow, right? Um, that's a pretty good, I, I, when, when did that happen? And you said the guy was paralyzed? Yeah. Wow. Alright, any other questions or comments about that? Alright, then we move on. So we just looked at negligence. Now we are going to look at the defenses against negligence, right? So how it is knowledge what constitutes negligence and who can be named, and where the elements are, and all of that, how we can limit the liability for negligence. Uh, all of that is good, you know, for us to kind of be proactive, uh, trying to avoid that, right? Trying to avoid being uh, the subject of a lawsuit for negligence. But if we do happen to be named in one of those lawsuits, then we also want to have the knowledge as to uh, about you know how we can go about defending ourselves, right? So there are certain um, ways in which we can do that, right? Before that, we're going to learn about how there are different body of laws in which we can frame our defenses against negligence, right? Uh, more specifically, there are three. The first one is is called common law, and this is the body of negligence. Um, the pretty much says that there are a set of principles and rules of actions that are derived uh, that derive their authority solely from the prior judgments and decrees of the court. Having read all that definition, what what's one more for that? Precedent. Precedent. So it's pretty much the body of, of the law that looks at precedent. How did the court rule and how did the court go about making a decision on a specific case? And then if they found a case with similar characteristics in the future, what they do is that they look at that present, look at that previous case, and then they kind of uh, uh, determine an outcome based on that previous case. So it's present. It's pretty much common law is based on present, right? This is just a longer way of saying that. Uh, the second uh, body of law in which a defense against negligence can be framed is contract law, right? And this is the body, body of law that governs the rules regarding binding agreement between parties, right? This pretty much the law that says, once you enter into agreement with somebody, it's binding and we enforce it as such, right? We enforce the terms of that agreement, right? So it's contract law or that contract. And then the third, uh, law or body of law in which a defense against negligence can be framed is a um, uh, statutory law, right? And this is the body of law that is created by acts of the legislative uh, body. And this is pretty much laws that says if this happened, this other happened, right? Uh, like statutory law. One example would be statute of limitations, right? The legislative uh, body has already established that for certain uh, cases, uh, the plaintiffs will have uh, just a certain amount of time to file a, a lawsuit, right? Uh, and that's a statutory, right? It tells you that the statute of limitations, right? It tells you uh, one to four years or whatever, right? Depending on the case. Right? And then they kind of give you other, other, what do you call it, exceptions and things about that. All right, so the first one, the first body of law is common law. And then common law has three different ways uh, that you can utilize common law to amount your defense, 
against negatives. Can you still hear me? All right, so the first, the first part, subunit of common law uh, that you can use for, as a defense for negligence is assumption of risk. Uh, then the second one is immunity. And then the third one is ultra-virus act. All right. So the first one is assumption of risk. What is that one? What does it mean? Give me an example. Let's discuss. I was thinking that was Right? Uh, 
uh, or you could, you know, one of the dangerous evidence that you could die, you know. So don't kind of assure code it, right? So you have to be as clear, blunt, and, and honest about what the risks are. Then this could be part of your defense. If you say, well, I mean, you can just my, you know, suffer a sprain, you know, and then the person kind of breaks everything, you know, is, you know, kind of a withheld a little bit, not good for you. Right? Uh, so another element is that the plaintiff uh, uh, chooses to take part of the activity on a voluntary basis, right? So these two plus that third one that I just mentioned, the, the plaintiff uh, chooses to participate on a voluntary basis, right? So knowing all of this, he or she still says, okay, okay, I know this, I'm gonna go ahead and participate. I'm gonna go ahead and take part. So the risk must be inherent to the activity, the plaintiffs must know of the risks, and they participate on a voluntary basis. And those are the three elements for assumption of risk to stake. All right. Um, And uh, uh, just look at it for about a minute, and then I'm gonna go around the room and you tell me um, what uh, risk would be inherent to each one of these activities. So, what would you think would be the inherent 